Hi, everyone. This is Rob Gray from ASU and the Perception Action Podcast again. In this presentation, I want to look at how we can take advantage of some of the aspects of virtual reality, VR, virtual environments to implement a constraints-led approach to coaching. And this is a presentation I'll be giving at ESAN uh, in, in the next week. So for me, and uh, I've written this a few different times, for me, the real value from VR training in sports comes as a value added, right? It should not, in my opinion, be trying to replace real world training, right? I don't think it will ever reach the fidelity of doing, if you have time to do real world training, do that. But I think it offers many, many opportunities for value added. In particular, I feel that one of the things we can use it is for is to implement um, training designs guided by sound motor learning principles we've, we've developed from research that are kind of impractical or impossible to do in real training on the field, right? So taking advantage of VR, using it for what we can't do in the, on the real environment is I really think the way to go. And one of those I think we can really do is to implement a constraints-led approach to practice design. And as many people know, if you're in sports science, this is inc becoming increasingly popular. I'm, I'm not going to go into all the details of it. There's a, a resource page I've set up there for if you want links to research and, and articles and, and the podcast episodes I've done on it. But the basic idea of constraints-led approach is we're going to add a constraint, which can be in form of a, usually in the form of a task constraint. We're going to change the task we're doing to try to destabilize your existing movement solution. So make it so what you're doing now will not solve the, new, the task we've given you. The reason we do that is we want to encourage you to explore, right, and, and find a new solution through self-organization. So we're not telling you the answer. We're trying to push you and get you to explore. And through doing this, if we design the constraint well, we can invite you uh, certain affordances and give you information about how to, to find a new solution and so on, right? And so we can do this, as I said, through these, these task constraints. So this, as I said, is becoming an increasingly popular method. And there's lots of evidence showing over there. There's a few of the studies showing that it can be effective. Um, but there are some problems with implementing it in real training, right? It, um, there's practical issues, right? If you want to manipulate task constraints, uh, field size, player number, different equipment, uh, so on and so forth, um, never mind trying to manipulate an environmental thing like friction or wind, um, can be very difficult. At the, at the very least, they're impossible to control, and the most they're impossible to control. At the very least, they become take up a lot of your practice time, which is very limited. Moving equipment around, moving things around uh, can be uh, problematic. The second issue is trying to individualize the training, right? One of the keys to using the constraints-led approach is to make sure the task constraints that you add blend well with the individual constraints of the performer, right? One of the examples of this is with variability. You don't want to add a ton of variability to a practice for a, a very new novice performer that has a whole lot of variability in their movement already, inherent variability, right? It's just going to cause chaos. So you want to challenge people at the right level. You want to kind of customize it. How do you do that in a field where you're trying to coach a bunch of different people and, and so on? Another issue is, is kind of how do you make the gains you get from using constraints that approach sticky and stay there, right? At some point, you're going to have to take the constraints away. If we're playing small-sided games in soccer, we're going to have to go back to full-sided games at some point. How do we do that smoothly and so we'll, we'll keep our gains? And another thing that we often find when using the CLA in the real world, and I'll show you an example of this later on, is that Often the ones, although the constraints are there, they offer very limited feedback on the person's search. What sometimes with new, what's called indirect uh, learning, information for learning or transition feedback. How do I find a new solution? Uh, can be very limited in in, in um, real world CLA manipulations. So what I want to so VR to the rescue. Let's look at how we can implement this VR. And I'll, for this, I'm going to talk about a couple of my fairly recent studies. Uh, this was a study I did in 2018 where we're trying to increase batter's launch angle, right? So recently in baseball, there's been a move to try to hit the ball more in the air. 
Um, batters are taught younger to put the ball on the ground, but the fielders are too good. And with the change in the flight of the ball, there's just much more value to be gained by having a higher launch angle. And this which graph is kind of showing that. So getting the ball in the air. And so what we're going to do to get this, or we're not going to tell the batter how to hit the ball in the air or hit it with a different launch angle. We're going to add a task constraint in the form of a barrier. You have to hit the ball over and um, let the batter self-organize and find a new solution to satisfy this task constraint. And of course, you couldn't do this in the real world, right? We could put a fence across the screen, across the field, and teams do this, that you have to hit the ball over. You're in batting practice, you hit it, and if it's into the fence, that counts as an hour to hit over the fence. The problem with this is kind of how do I challenge you in the right way, right? Uh, do, where do I put it? Really close? Really far? Um, if I'm going to put it far, do I have a fence tall enough, right? So it's, there's practical issues with it. it. It does work, but it's you have to move the fence all around. Other way we can do it is in a batting cage, right? So we can have you in a batting cage and mark things on the top of the screen that correspond to the launch angle we want you to have. Um, that works as well. The problem is this is a good example of the feedback problem I mentioned earlier. Um, so an effective hit when you satisfy the tax control uh, constraints in this is the ball is going to go up into the top of the screen, hit it hard and fall by your feet, which is not very rewarding to a batter as opposed to hitting a home run on a real field, right? So it can be a, a bit of a challenge with that. So VR to the rescue, what we can do in VR, of course, is, and this is what I did in this study, is have a barrier on the field that you have to hit over with the distance and size of the barrier adjusting based on your performance. In this case, we use kind of a staircase um, where if you can hit it over the barrier successfully, we move it out and make it taller, right? Um, so we can kind of challenge you at your right at level. If you can hit it above the barrier, we move it closer and so on. And in that study, what we found is when we did that kind of constraints manipulation um, as compared to using more traditional instructions where we were telling you how to get the ball in the air more. We found batters had less balls on the ground, right? We we're taking that away from them. They had more home runs, more balls in the air. They hit it with higher velocity, right? So the, this was a really effective way to implement the constraints-led approach, I think, in, in, um, in, in this VR. The other example, and one of the reasons we saw why there was this improvement, this is a looking at kind of the the batter's bat path, is we found that the constraints used in the VR in, um, encourage much more exploration on the side of the batter. They were trying out different angles and things, which is exactly what we wanted. The other study is one that I just published the later last year, um, looking at the task of opposite field hitting. So getting a batter to hit the ball to the, if you're standing on the right side, over to the left side, which can be challenging. In real baseball, there are a bunch of constraints that we use for this, right? We can put a screen uh, right against the plate so the batter has to kind of keep their hands in the right place or else they bang into the screen. We can put a piece of PVC pipe across the thing so to get your bat to follow a certain path, okay? Um, these are, again, good. They, they work. There can be practical issues when you have um, a uh, lot of players you're coaching. There's also kind of this, um, you know, transition problem. What do I do? How do I take this away? If I take this away, you're just going to go back to swim, swinging like you normally did. In VR, I can take this away on the third of the trials, or you know, it's very easy to to manipulate that. So, and I should point out, I'm not kind of advocating getting rid of these real world manipulations. I think they would could work hand in hand very well. Another one that's commonly used is, that I like a lot is a connection ball. So you hold this ball under your arm. Uh, if you separate your arm from your body too early, it falls out. In this study I mentioned, we implemented all these things in the VR. So we implemented a barrier, we implemented a swing path, and we had a con connection ball, all virtual, right? And um, we compared it to a differential learning uh, uh, condition where we had people try different body postures and different swings versus a traditional instruction where we told you how to hit opposite field. And what we found again is the, 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 the CLA manipulation seemed to work very well, right? It made you get more hits in the right direction. It also made interesting people started to swing uh, at pitches that were actually better for what they were trying to achieve, more pitches on the inside of the plate, okay? On the outside of the plate as opposed to the inside. 
right? So again, good evidence of, of being able to effectively manipulate the constraints-led approach, right? So I think, as I said, VR, I think, is most effective for sports training if it can add value beyond what's done in real training, not replace it. And that, for me, the main way we can do that is to design practice conditions in VR that take advantage of and implement sound motor learning principles we know from research. Variability, these are all the reasons why my things worked in these studies, because I could take advantage of VR to make conditions more variable. I could take advantage of VR to just the settings just for you using some sort of staircase adaptive. I can implement these constraints. A lot, I can do crazy constraints um, uh, where they, and if, for example, I can fade them out based on your performance. And also I think uh, it allows for kind of more feedback, uh, effective feedback and information for you to explore. Right, so for me, I think this. I'm, I think the CLA is a great approach to coaching in general, and I think using a conjunction of real constraints manipulations and, and these kind of virtual ones can be a very effective way to coach. Uh, thank you very much.